Hello, my friend. In today's episode, I'm speaking with fellow Business of Unicorns coach Amanda Wheeler, and Coach Wheels shares some incredible tips on how to get unstuck in your life. So if you struggle with imposter syndrome or procrastination or perfectionism, we talk about how to get unstuck in this episode. So keep on listening. <music> Hello, fitness business nerds. What's up? Welcome to another episode of the Business for Unicorns podcast. I'm here with Wheels today. What's up, Wheels? What's up? <laughs> it's been a minute since you've been on the podcast. Welcome back. Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I, for those of you who didn't listen to previous podcasts with Wheels, Wheels is, uh, is a, was a member of Mark Fisher Fitness for many years. Wheels is a coach at Business for Unicorns, working with our Unicorn Society members these days. Um, she also does her own coaching consulting out in the world. So you can hire her no matter where you work <laughs> and what you do. You can pay Wheels <laughs> for her brilliance and time. There, I'm just selling you to whoever will help you. out there. Yeah. <laughs> appreciate it. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I specifically wanted to have Wheels back because Wheels does so much great coaching um, uh, out in the world with people who are stuck in life. I mean, it's kind of one of the things, I've, one of the ways I've seen you put yourself out there as like a life coach, business coach, success coach, growth coach, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and one of the things ways I've seen you put yourself out there is like, hey, people in the world, if anyone's feeling a little stuck. Um, and there's some common ways that people are stuck. So I thought we would talk about those common ways, you know, yeah. things, things like procrastination, things like imposter syndrome. And I can go on and talk about all the isms and syndromes and, you know, th we can we'll get to many of them, I'm sure. But let's just talk with, about some of the basic ways that as coaches, you've seen people be stuck. And then we'll talk a little bit about ways you've seen people get unstuck with that problem. So let's just start with the basics of procrastination. Um, so talk to me a little bit about your experience seeing procrastination in your clients. Yeah. <laughs> and in so, yourself maybe, right? Yeah, <laughs> totally. Myself. Yeah. I mean, this does not, uh, you know, everyone experiences it in some way. And, you know, a lot of people that I work with are either like small business owners or they're creative artists or they're, they want to do something that is, you know, outside of what they'd normally do in their like day to day. Yep. Um, and there are so many things that come up and I think, you know, and we have several like the reasons people procrastinate. Yeah. And you know, one of them is, is so big. It's like, obviously like we don't like to do tedious shit, yeah. right? It's like, I don't want to unload the dishwasher. Like I don't want to fold the laundry. <clears throat> and so it's like to avoid just like the tedious things that we don't want to do is like super simple that everybody goes through. And, uh, another one is that I see actually a lot in fitness and people's like fitness clients and, you know, mm -hmm. a ton of MFF, but just in general is that we, think that will be our idealized selves on Monday, mm -hmm. right? It's like, I'm thinking about doing fitness or I'm going to, you know, start to write my book and I'm going to take Thursday and I'm not going to start right now because on Monday I'm going to be this version of myself that I'm not today. And it's like newsflash, like you're not, you're going to be the same in four days that you are today. <clears throat> but it's uh, this fantasy of being our idealized selves. And then, you know, another reason is really just to avoid unpleasant feelings. Mm -hmm. So especially for like business owners, um, doing the things that maybe you're not good at. It's like if you're a coach, if you're a fitness coach and you're great at programming and you're great at even like managing people or coaching, like if you are not good at marketing, if you are not good at, you know, advertising, putting yourself out there in any capacity, we start to feel certain ways about ourselves when we're not good. And especially yeah. as adults, like we don't like to suck at shit. Yep. Like we want to be good out the gate. And because we're good in one facet of business or in creativity, it doesn't necessarily translate to other parts. And then we feel bad about ourselves. So a lot of it is to like, avoid unpleasant feelings about ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. Let me just repeat the list. So, you know, tedious tasks, of course, no one likes to like, you know, well, very few people that I know love to fold the laundry, empty the dishwasher, right. Um, you know, put all those numbers in a spreadsheet, you know, like whatever it is, go through your finances and all your receipts. You know, there's a plenty of tedious tasks. <clears throat> there's, there's the, um, there's like, I'm going to start tomorrow energy that also comes with, with procrastination that I'm going to be a different person tomorrow um and that's a kick it kick it kick the can down the road kind of kind of energy do you like my stutter there <clears throat> yeah. and um and the third one is just so <clears throat> uncomfortable feelings right? I, there's part of this task i'm not good at which makes me uncomfortable so i'm going to avoid that discomfort literally at all costs 
yeah, I think it's a great list. I think it's a great list. I think there's a, another, uh, I'll add one more to the list, which is, <clears throat> I think oftentimes we have these unconscious goals that are working in opposition to our stated goals that we just don't recognize, right? That we might have a goal of, <clears throat> of um, trying to think of, uh, you know, of getting in shape, let's say, but we also have a goal of, um, of, of, uh, of also like exploring all the different foods available to me in the world. <laughs> right? Right. <laughs> yeah. And like, we consciously aware that there's something under the surface that we also care about that maybe we value and like really matters to us, but it's under the surface and it's pulling us in the opposite direction. Um, so yeah, there's another one that I think uh, I'll add to the list, but so let's just talk a little bit about like, you know, how do we work people through this, right? And procrastination usually is not something you can just snap your fingers and change about yourself overnight. So how have you successfully work with people to overcome procrastination? Yeah. So I think one is just identifying the ways that people are procrastinating. And some of them are so obvious, right? I call it like shameless procrastination where you like watch Netflix, you scroll, you masturbate or whatever you do to yeah. <laughs> whatever you do to procrastinate. It's very shameless and people get it. They're like, they know they're doing it. So, um, you know, it's identifying that, uh, ways that they are procrastinating, um, that are comfortable, right? So again, it's like doing the thing that you are good at uh, instead of a thing that, mm -hmm. you know, you're not good at. So that's one way, another way to identify it. Um, an additional way is like productive procrastination. So I have a to-do list and uh, these are the important things down here, but like, I'm going to get all these other things done. And that makes me feel good because I check the box. So I'm being productive, even though I'm like, you know, I'm working toward my list, but I'm not actually doing the thing. And then the, the biggest one I think for people that we have to work through is like disguised procrastination. Mm -hmm. And that is like, um, I'm going to take another course. Mm -hmm. I don't have enough credentials. Mm -hmm. I, I need, I'm going to read this book or I'm going to do anything around the thing that I need to do. And so first we like identify what's happening. What are people doing besides the thing? And then we just start to make little plans of like, okay, in this moment, now that we know these are the ways you procrastinate, what are the little steps we can do to take it? And it's literally like the first step that's always the hardest yeah. because like we can know things about ourselves and it's like, okay, now I have to sit down at the keyboard and like start to type or I need, okay, I really need to like, you know, go look at my marketing tools and like mm -hmm. take that first step. Um, and, and what I typically do is like have people do just like the lowest hanging fruit. What is the one, the smallest thing they can do to like take a yeah. piece of a step in the direction that they want to go thing that they want to do. Yeah. I love that. So if I can repeat that process for like our listeners, it's really, it starts with some self-awareness It's of recognizing what are the patterns that you've been in that are preventing you from doing the damn thing you say you want to be doing. Right. Uh, and then you can start with, once you have that self-awareness, um, uh, disrupting the pattern right? Finding a new way of approaching it. So, say you want to be a writer and you've been taking all these writing classes and reading books on writing and downloading all the writing apps, but you haven't written a fucking thing, right? Then you, once you recognize that there's a pattern of you, you know, <clears throat> doing all the things around it, then, you know, in a, co in a coaching call, we can say, okay, how about you write a paragraph right yeah. now? I'm going to give you three minutes, write a paragraph, right? We just start with the tiniest baby step, low hanging fruit. And, you know, this is where we embrace shitty first drafts, right? Mm -hmm. This is where we just, we, we just get the reps in. Uh, but yeah, that's easier said than done, right? Because there'll be real anxiety around taking that first step quite often. And I, I find, tell me if this has been true for you, I find that um, a, a close cousin to procrastination is perfectionism, right? I yes. find a lot, a, lot, a, lot of, a lot of people who procrastinate a lot, procrastinate out of that fear of failure of it not being perfect, not yep. being right, you know, and it goes right to that uncomfortable feeling that you were mentioning, right? Well, yep. there's anything to avoid <clears throat> feeling uncomfortable. And the discomfort for a lot of people is like, oh, I'm gonna suck so hard at this for a while. And I think of myself as a perfectionist. So being yep. bad feels like, you know, have you experienced that much with clients? Oh yeah. yeah. Yes, and even on the smallest, like, I'm not gonna say insignificant, but it's like people just posting on social media. Mm -hmm. feeling like I'm not editing this right or my face looked a weird way when I did that or I'm not the caption I'm not saying exactly what I need to do yeah. and it's like with that sort of like you know kind of smaller like my new things it's like nobody's actually listening at first like nobody's paying to like we scroll you know it's like it's that kind of stuff but yeah perfectionism is a huge 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 thing and I think you know 
obviously if, if you have a business, like you want to do the best job that you can. And I know a lot of, you know, I work with a lot of performers and creative types and their job does kind of depend on presenting a certain way. But that being said, it's like, then they just never do anything. They're never, they, they aren't even good because they, you know, they just don't do it. But yeah, perfection is huge. Yeah. I think the, the, the biggest antidote I found to perfectionism is practice, right? If people can learn to just like be in a shitty <clears throat> practice, right? Like, like people practice, um, for sports, people practice in the arts, right? There's rehearsals that you right? like that people just practice right? yeah. and get out of the idea that everything needs to be a finished product um, mm -hmm. and that goes to your tiny steps so i think they, they all these all go hand in hand they really do um the one thing I, I will say is that there's a decent amount of research that shows that there's some forms and you i think you alluded to this a little bit earlier there's some forms of procrastination that are actually really valuable and some research has shown that procrastinators actually tend to do better quality work because they will often ruminate and think more deeply yeah. about a thing than just kind of getting it done and checking the box. Mm -hmm. So I want to leave a little, you know, a, a little window cracked for a little door crack to open for our procrastinators to say, there's some times for being a procrastinator is procrastinator is going to be fantastic, right? If you really need to do something that requires deep thinking, a uh, real personal connection to it, like taking your time to do something can be valuable and it has its limits in certain sure. contexts doesn't work. But, um, but I think that there's, there's something to be said for people who need to go slowly in a mm -hmm. world that goes fast. And sometimes as leaders, we need to make that okay. Yeah. Well, I think what's, there's a, there's a name for it though, too, right? Where it's kind of like, if you leave it open-ended or unfinished, that it kind of runs like a, a computer tab in the background where you are yeah. kind of like, you know, yeah. subconsciously thinking through those things and they come out yes, like in their own time, which is, is good. Yeah, 100%. Uh, and I, I'm I'm a little bit like that in some ways in my life, right? Like, you know, in, in school right now, for example, I'm a little bit of a binge writer. So I'll make an outline uh, and then sit with that outline for maybe weeks. And then I'll go maybe add a few more thoughts to the outline as I have daydreams about it or come across research that's valuable. And then I will sit down and write a 20, 30, 40 page paper in a day or mm -hmm. you know, two days because my brain has been subconsciously working on that outline. And I've been dancing on the landscape of that content in my mind for weeks or maybe months. And mm -hmm. then I can sit down and I don't recommend that for everyone. That's not an approach that maybe <laughs> works in every context, but in that context where you're writing long ass papers for school, right? That I can, procrastination really actually is beneficial to me in some ways. Uh, yeah, but yeah. I forget what but it's called. There's a name for it, yeah. There's a name for it. But I think it's like, it comes back then again to like self-awareness. Like yes. you know that about yourself and you know you can like kick it into drive as, as thoughts come. Um, and it's like people have to understand and know that about themselves to actually yes. make it work in their favor. Yeah, 100%. And I'll say that there's plenty of times as a leader where I probably should have fanned the flames of procrastination a little bit more and let things take more time and not try to get everything to move so quickly, right? I think that can be really valuable with certain kinds of creative work, content creation work, et cetera. But um, let's switch gears because I know we can keep talking about procrastination all damn day. And I think we talked a little bit about perfectionism as well. Hello, my friend, Michael here, just jumping in with a quick reminder that if you want to level up as a manager or leader in your gym, then you should be attending our upcoming course. It's Management and Leadership for Gym Owners. It's May 6th and 7th, all day from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern. You also get the recording of the workshop if you can't attend live. I would love to see you there. If you're listening to this message, that means there's still spots available. So click the link in the show notes to find out more and enroll or go to businessfeedacorns.com slash management. Hope to see you in the course. But let's talk about another one that pops up a ton, which is imposter syndrome, right? Mm -hmm. And it's not completely unrelated to what we've been talking about, but it does feel like a different flavor of stuckness. So you can, can you talk a little bit about how you see imposter syndrome creep up in people's people's worlds? Yeah, I think imposter syndrome, again, like happens for all of us trying anything new um, or something that is, yeah, just uh, uncomfortable or unexplored territory. And the first, when I talk with my people, it's like, you should feel like an imposter at first, right? You've never done it before. There's no reason yeah. that you should be good. There's no reason you should know all the answers. There's no reason like it should feel comfortable. Like if you have a little bit of imposter syndrome, that's probably good, mm -hmm. right? There's like value in that. Yeah, uh, it means you stepped out of your comfort zone. Yes. Yeah. yeah. There's value in it. And, um, you know, obviously, like you mentioned practice, one thing is just like taking action, taking action, taking action, because unless you get your reps in, there's no, like, you're never going to feel comfortable. You're always going to feel like an imposter. Um, but something, uh, there, there's a book called the imposter cure by Dr. Jessamy Hibbard. Mm -hmm. And you know, something that she talks about is like, when we 
fail, when we're not doing our best work, when we're, you know, we feel stuck or we feel like an imposter. It comes from something internal. Like we think that is our fault. Mm -hmm. Like we feel that it means something about me. And then when we succeed, it's like everything's external. Well, it's because I had help. Oh, it's because of this person, you know, I, I was lucky. I, you know, um, and it's interesting to think about in imposter syndrome where if, if things are bad, then it's because of us personally. And if things are good, it's because of something external. And I think, you know, a lot of people I work with, it's like, look back on your successes. Like, look at what you've actually done, even though it's new territory. Like, you have worked your ass off to get to this place. And like, you deserve to be in this, <laughs> like where you are. Um, but just like owning the discomfort, but realizing like your wins and the things you're creating are also internal and it's because of you. Yeah. Well, I think, I think it's a fascinating way to, to think about it, right? That I, I love what you first said, which is you should feel like an imposter when you're trying something new, right? Like that, that is a great signal that you are onto something new for yourself where you don't have all the answers yet. And that's okay, right? You're new at this thing. If you're making a switch in your life in some way or learning a new skill. Um, and I love the idea that, you know, you really want to take stock in what am I attributing to myself and what am I attributing to my environment? Right. And if things are going well, am I attributing that to my environment? Am I, can I take some of the credit for myself? And the reverse is true. If I'm doing really poorly, am I attributing it all to myself and, and not to the environment? And even just having that conversation with yourself, I think can be helpful in getting unstuck. Right. Even just bringing some awareness to like, am I blaming myself for not being good at this thing? I just started doing this week. Right. And just having that conversation, I think is valuable. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. What else have you seen as valuable to people who were feeling imposter syndrome? I mean, obviously like anybody that is like, it's like having a mentor mm -hmm. of some capacity, like having a coach, obviously it's like how we kind of talk about procrastination. Like, do you have disguised procrastination because you're taking all these courses and reading? It's like, it, it's a fine line, mm -hmm. but it's like, obviously like learning helps, but really for most people, it, it is just that little step every day. It's just like do it, getting in reps because then you learn things like it, it, we can read a ton of books, but it's like, until we have that application, mm -hmm. we're still going to feel like imposters. Right. So it's like, what, how can I get people just writing the first paragraph? Mm -hmm. uh, because then it's like, you start to become, it's like, who do you want to become? I want, I am a writer. I want to become a writer. Like what does a writer have to do then? Like, and when you do it, you are a writer. It's well, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that it's so wise. I mean, and, and, and there is a little bit of, um, there's a little evidence behind the phrase of fake it till you make it, right? There's actually real evidence that we can, we can like uh, action our way to a new identity, right? By doing it, we will see ourselves as it, right? Yeah. And so just by getting in the reps and committing to all the small steps that you, you wheels has been referencing here like you know that people will start to see themselves as a different person as they get in the reps um but it, you know i think for me when i hear people with imposter syndrome at the heart of it is a real um uh, unhelpful commitment to comparison right like because the imposter is only an imposter in comparison to other people who they see as not imposters right for sure, <laughs> so for sure. i think that's another piece of this so i think people can find if they dig a little deep into like okay, why does that comparison really matter to you why are you constantly comparing the way you're showing up or delivering uh to other people and that's to other businesses to other people you know in your family to you know friends um and you know we i think we're hardwired to do it we're hardwired for to sure. compare ourselves yeah. to others but to really think about how valuable that is, that comparison is in a moment when you are trying to get unstuck or try something new or stretch yourself outside your comfort zone, that comparison might not be useful in that moment. Right. right? Maybe compare yourself when you're a few months in, a few years in, right, to your peers to see if you, you know, how far you still have to come. But when you're still, when you're just learning, you know, it's, it's, it seems so unhelpful. We wouldn't do that to our kids, I hope, right? Like when our little baby's learning to walk, we're not like, look at that baby, they're walking, right? Like, sure. it's like, <laughs> hopefully, maybe it's embarrassing. <laughs> my, my family might have done it to me, who knows? But, um, but you know, like, it's just so unhelpful to the person learning. And it's so clear to yeah. see when it's not you, but we do it to ourselves. Well, I think, you know, another point is like, 
we don't just compare ourselves to like the baby who can walk. We compare ourselves to like Usain uh-huh. Bolt, who who is a sprinter, <laughs> right? No, but but it's like we pick yeah. the top person who's maybe an outlier yeah. in the maybe, field, like maybe Usain who's sprinting. <laughs> but even like it's like we pick, you know, it's like it, it, when I'm like starting to you know write or make little mm-hmm. videos, and I'm like comparing myself to like, oh gosh, I'm not Brene Brown or James Clear, like this is terrible. I'm like yeah. they've been doing it for years, and I'm like just starting, so it's like you yeah. can't compare your chapter one to their chapter one hundred. Yeah. And it's like, you know, finding somebody that's like a couple of years ahead of you is a, is a great place to start if you want to not even compare, but just like be inspired. It's like, okay, what is the person two years ahead of like me doing? What, what has been successful for them instead of like, who's at the very top of their game that is famous? It's yeah. like, there's no comparison. You have to like start super small. Yeah. 100%. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah. That made me, made me really just, just think about how important it is to have external feedback when you're learning something new. Right, how how it can be valuable. You mentioned coaches, um, you know, even just a friend, an accountability buddy, someone to contextualize for you. Like, hey, from over here, wheels, what you're doing looks pretty great to me. Like, from over here, wheels, what you're doing looks like amazing first step. Right, to have mm-hmm. that. That's so much what we do with our clients as coaches. Right, it's just yeah. like as a person over here outside of your world with no dog in this race. I can objectively tell you like what you just shared with me seems perfectly acceptable. It's very normal. Like what a great experience, what a great first step. And that kind of validation really matters for a lot of people Yeah, and can help them get out of that cycle of just, you know, self, uh, self degradation and comparison. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what other ways we have maybe time for one more, what other ways do you often uh, encounter clients, people you're working with in your life, or maybe you yourself, what other ways are people stuck, get stuck in their life? You know, I think a lot of people and, you know, myself included, it's like, what do I want to be when I grow up? Mm. I have so many choices. I, you know, a lot of people good on them are are good at a lot of things. Michael Keeler, Michael Keeler is so good at so many things, like upsetting how good you are at literally everything. And there are so many directions people can go. And I think they get stuck on what if I make the wrong choice Mm. and thinking like if they choose one thing, they have to do that for the rest of their life. There can be no pivoting. Uh, and I think there's so much stuckness in regretting a decision. Mm. So they don't make any decision. And so, yeah, yeah. yeah, People get very stuck there. That's interesting. I think I would, you know, I would, I agree 100%. I see this all the time and it's less of a fear of failure. It feels more like the word use is a fear of regret. Like, I fear I'm going to make a decision that I'm going to regret, which is just so fascinating to me because, you know, I can see that being the case for our grandparents or our mm-hmm. great grandparents. But these days, it is the norm that people stay in a job for two years, three yeah. years, or you know, like that. Their people are moving around constantly. So, uh, you know, I guess, you know, for us as coaches, the thing we get to explore when people have that issue is like, you know, where's the idea coming from that you have to pick just once? This is mm-hmm. a one-time decision. There's just right. so few decisions these days where that's the, that's the case. Mm-hmm. Everything gets a second draft, right? Everything can, you know, for the most part, right? There's some things that are pretty, you know, buy a house. It's kind of hard to undo it, right? But, you know, there's very few things like that. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, where do you think this impulse comes from in people? I mean, this I think going... Of like, I'm afraid to choose because I'm afraid I'm going to pick the wrong thing. I think it goes back to like part of like perfectionism, like yeah. in their lives, but it's, you know, again, I think it, one, it's just like having way too many choices, mm. but, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, I think it's obviously like we said, regret, but, but really, you know, I think for a lot of people, it's, it's what they should choose mm. versus, you know, maybe what's more practical or, you know, I should be doing this. I'm good. You know, I've given this example before, like my degree was in music education. I studied classical saxophone, which is a very useless uh, <laughs> instrument to study and play. Cause you know, who wants to hear classical saxophone? Nobody, not even me. Um, but uh, <laughs> I loved it. But um, you know, I had this like, Oh man, that's what I studied. And like, I, I should choose this because I felt like I had to, or I should, mm. um, instead of like, you know, Mark Cuban has this thing, like, don't follow your passion. Uh, you know, follow, um, gosh, what am I saying? Uh, you know, follow basically like what you do, follow like your practices, follow, uh, you know, 
gosh, I can't even remember the word he said, but it was so good. It's like, don't follow your passion, follow your. Yeah. Something about your behaviors, your actions. Yeah. Yeah. About, yeah your habits or something. Yeah. It's something. Yeah. Like that. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, I think that's, you know, one big thing is what should I do? Like, what does the world want me to do versus what I want to do? Mm-hmm. But there is a practicality around it too, right? It's like, if you want to pursue being a full-time ceramic artist, but you live in New York city and you have to pay bills and you've never done it before, like, you know, money is a big thing, but I think, you know, one of the ways that you have really, and I've done this a ton in my life or, and you've seen it before where I'm like, okay, I'm like slowly kind of chiseling. Like, what do I not like? What do I like? And I played this game. Really? It's like warmer, colder, mm-hmm. like a kid game. It's like, okay, am I getting, am I going to try this thing? Am I getting warmer? Yes. Okay. I'm going to try Am I getting colder? Yes. And I've talked about this, like nu- nu- nutrition coaching yeah. where, you know, you're a coach and I get a nutrition coaching sir, because that's kind of what everybody does. And I should be new- coaching nutrition. And I like, did it. And I hated it. I hate coaching nutrition. It's like the, mm-hmm. my least favorite thing. And then, then I felt, okay, like, okay, I'm going to set that down. Even though I did the PN, I coached for years. And it's like, Nope, yeah. that is colder. I don't want to do that. So it's yeah. like playing that little game is super helpful. Yeah. I think it's a really useful kind of reframe. Cause I think as, as you're pointing out, so many people feel like they have to make big life decisions about how they spend their time, what they do for their careers based out of some deep kind of obligation of what they feel like they should be doing. I feel like I should be doing this because it's my degree. I should be doing this because I need to make money for my family. I should be doing this because I told people I was going to, I should be doing this, but you know, there's a lot of obligation driving a lot of those decisions. And the, the alternative to that that you pointed out so beautifully is, is to commit to experimentation, right? Commit to, I'm going to try some shit and play that on my warmer, colder game. Like, am I getting closer to something that feels great to me or not? Uh, Cause not everyone has the ability to kind of, uh, you know, uh, uplift their, you know, flip over their life in a day. We got bills to pay, you know, obligations to family and people that we care about. But, um, but I think if we can put on that kind of scientist experimenter hat and actually allow ourselves, give ourselves the permission to play around and try and dabble and experiment, I think we will, we, and when we can recognize in ourselves when we're getting warmer or closer, that feels like a great thing to replace that kind of obligation and, you know, fear of regret with, right? So I think that's a, that's a great reframe. Yeah. Well, maybe we'll leave it there, my friend. Let's leave it there. We, leave can, it there. we can do, we could do this all day, but, but I think, <laughs> I think, you know, I think for our listeners, the things I, you know, I want to, you know, want people to take away is that the theme that seems throughout our conversation today is whenever you're stuck, it helps by starting with some self-awareness and recognizing what are your, what patterns are you stuck in? Sometimes it's helpful to talk to a coach like wheels, <laughs> talk to a coach like me, right. And figure out, can you help me identify my patterns? And then taking small baby steps to make adjustments, find those reframes, find those mindset shifts to actually try something new. Uh, and sometimes it's a shitty first draft. Sometimes it's just experimenting and practice that it starts with. Um, and, uh, and, you're going to feel uncomfortable at first, but that's, that's what growth looks like. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's what change looks like. Yeah. Anything else you would say is, is a theme from our conversation? Yeah. I mean, I don't know if I would say, I don't know about any other themes, yeah. but I, I think just in general, just to throw this out there is like every person experiences it from the most successful and a lot of times the most successful maybe have a little bit more insecurity around where they are but it's just like everyone goes through it like nobody is exempt from going through these things as you're pursuing something that is challenging or new um and so just like don't try not to feel alone in it because literally everybody (laughs) everybody does it yeah i love that that's a great way to end wheels thank you so much for having this conversation Thanks for being your incredible self, sharing your wisdom with our listeners. It's so valuable. Um, And listeners, if you found this episode um, uh, valuable and useful, please leave us a five-star review everywhere you listen. And email us. Let us know what you want us to talk about next. My email is michael at businessunicorns.com. Wheels is wheels at businessunicorns.com, W-H-E-E-L-S. And keep us posted on who you want me to talk to next, what topics you want us to cover. Um, And thanks again for the great conversation, Wheels. We'll talk soon. Yes. Thanks for having me. See you on the next one. Bye. Bye.